Hello and welcome to episode number eight of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast. Today is Sunday, July 27th, 2014. I'm Melissa Agnes, and this podcast is brought to you by Agnes Day. Let's talk crisis intelligence. Hi, Greg. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me here today. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? Well, I'm Greg Power. I'm the president of Weber Shamwick in Canada, and Weber Shamwick is one of the leading public relations agencies globally. We're uh, all around the world, uh, 18 offices in North America, four of them are in Canada. And uh, it's a pretty exciting time to, to be in the industry because there's so much transformation in the type of things we do. We, of course, do all of the things you would expect from a conventional PR agency, but we're also getting into uh, a lot more interesting areas in terms of digital and content creation and distribution of that content uh, through uh, multiple channels, both online, offline, and, and live. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time. It is a pretty exciting time. And you have a passion for, well, um, yeah, I guess I could say that. You have a passion for the art or the power of storytelling in a crisis. Yes. Well, I have a passion for storytelling overall, and I think its, it's, uh, it's attributes and its merits can be seen both when you're trying to establish a brand or a reputation, and so it's something that, that – um, clients and in fact even agencies should focus on always and when you're in a uh, in a crisis situation or you're managing an issue uh, the act of storytelling can very often be the difference between whether you're successful or not because to be a very good storyteller you need to empathize with the audience that you're addressing or wish to influence and often when people get into trouble in crisis it's because they've forgotten that and secondly uh, it's taking control of the narrative and to do that uh, if you're a strong storyteller you have so many uh, more opportunities to be trusted and effective in the way you respond to an issue than if you're just trying to uh, share information. I often say to people, information is not communication, storytelling is. And so uh, I'm very, very passionate about that. Uh, and uh, I, I can see the, the merits of it with uh, my clients and, uh, and in our organization every day. You know, what I love about your approach or this approach in particular, but really addressing it specifically is that we, you know, with social media today, we're, we're always hearing that we need to, brands need to tell stories in their marketing, in their, the foundation of who the brand is, where they come from. They need to develop a good story, a powerful story to be heard in through all of the noise and remembered, but not many think of it in terms of crisis communications. No. And, uh, it actually, the minute you start to explore storytelling, you find that just about everybody has a point of view on it. A lot of those people are surface, you know, sort of just skimming the surface of of what's really involved in terms of the, the way to do it and and why it's important. But if you you want to focus on on crisis communications, the the example that that I would give is, I would say over the last twenty years the most effective response to a crisis that I have seen was the response by Michael McCain from Maple Leaf Foods when they had Listeria break out in, uh, in their food chain uh, back in 2000 and I think it's 2007. And um, you, know, you had 20 people die and you had a, uh, this huge uh, uh, outbreak which you know, because it had followed SARS, people were were, you know, after SARS, they'd had, uh, they put into place uh, a system to identify what could be the next outbreak, and so it became this, and so people were on it right away. And uh, he, through the force of his personality and the courage uh, of being a leader and taking the lead in explaining what had happened 
and taking responsibility for it, actually as a storyteller dominated the narrative about that issue. And so what you saw was a very trusted and capable um, executive being the uh, most important source of information uh, on the issue. And as a result, it's told from his perspective and the perspective of Maple Leaf Foods. And that provided the company uh, a lot of protection during uh, a crisis that could easily uh, have uh, damaged that brand beyond repair. So when you looked at um, the actual coverage, you didn't see the government playing a huge role. You didn't see lawyers for victims or victims or uh, interest groups one way or the other dominating the coverage because uh, his leadership uh, framed the story. If, if he'd done what so many other companies do when they they forget to 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 tell their own story uh it gets told for you and in a case of a crisis it's going to be told by your opponents or your enemies or by people who just don't understand and the narrative is going to get framed in cement really quickly and then suddenly the only place you are is on the defensive so when i look at storytelling uh, and its use uh, in issues management. I think that is one of the the best examples. I I agree. That's it's. I remember the, the the case very clearly, and I remember as a consumer, as a Canadian consumer, my emotion watching his response, watching him communicate his message. And it's very true that um, you know the media, especially the media, is there in a crisis to paint. They're looking for a villain. They want to paint a villain because that's what sells their stories. That's what, you know, that's one of the um, challenges that organizations have in a crisis is not to become that villain. I mean, we look at MMA, they were the perfect villain. And we, uh, in that situation, nobody even media, nobody even dug further to say, hey, what was in, not what was in, but who was that oil going to? for mm -hmm. example. So it stopped there. The digging stopped there because they found their villain and that was a perfect story, perfect villain for the story. So telling your story and getting ahead of it and putting, not allowing yourself to become the villain of somebody else's story, of somebody else's headline for your story is extremely important. Yeah. And you know, what's, what's interesting there is, you know, what do reporters do? Well, they, they report stories, right? And, mm -hmm. and they're focused on stories. And the story, because I, I was a reporter once, is a really powerful imperative. Uh, and the better the story, uh, the better you look as, as a reporter. And so you're always trying to make decisions where you're not biasing the information to create a better story. You have to be truthful and honest and, and fair. But there's a lot of pressure to you know, be sensational and to, to be dramatic. And every story is, is ultimately uh, a drama. And a drama is a conflict that needs to be resolved. And a drama has actors in it who are you know, heroes and villains, to your, to your point. And your job is to understand that that's the way the story is going to be told, because that's how stories get told. And if you do not choose a role, it'll be chosen for you. And so, uh, you know, a, another example of uh, storytelling and, and issues management was uh, a file that, that I was fortunate enough to work on here over the holidays, and that was when the ice storm hit Toronto and Toronto Hydro you know, lost uh, its, uh, its grid and most of its customers were without power, uh, and it took about 10 days to finally get them all restored. And what was interesting is uh, they did... 1,500 interviews over a 10-day period and answered probably close to eight to 9,000 emails from counselors. And, you know, they have a really strong and uh, able internal communications team, but they're exhausted. And at the end of that, you know, I, I got a call and, and was asked, you know, what do you think we should do? Because somebody is going to wrap up this story. And, you know, we've done really well in the media coverage and we feel that we've done the right thing for, for our customers and for the city. But ultimately, we're exhausted and uh, we know that someone will write 
uh, a story that sums all of this up. And, you know, we have some issues. Our call center went down. People couldn't speak to us. People didn't understand why it took time to get reconnected. And my advice to them was you should tell this as a story. Don't do a press conference and answer questions and provide information that, that people then will make a story of, but turn it into a dramatic narrative because that is the best format for you to share that story and, and break it into sort of milestone moments of, of this crisis. And so start talking, you know, the crisis, I think the storm hit about 2 a.m. on a uh, on a Sunday morning. So uh, they knew the storm was coming on Wednesday. They didn't know it was going to hit or how hard it would be. So talk about when you first saw the storm. You know, that there's the, the drama at the beginning. And use that as a chance to talk about crisis simulations, preparedness, what you normally do because you track storms all the time. This one was coming from Texas. There's cold air coming from the north. It looks like it might hit in Toronto. We don't know. Uh, and continue to build... The, the, uh, the tension in the story and then get to the, the night of the storm. And, you know, what came out of that process was the, the head of grid operations for the utility said, uh, you know, I knew the storm was going to hit really uh, late that night. And so, and I'd be up probably for a day or two uh, dealing with the aftermath. So I went home and I went to bed and I got a nap. And when I woke up, probably 11 o'clock uh, at night and I opened my blinds and the horizon was orange. And in our business, there's two colors. There's blue, which is flash over and powers out. It'll be restored. And there's orange, which means that everything is on fire. And when I saw that, I knew how bad the situation was. And I went into the office and the bells are, are ringing and lights are flashing and I'm at the control center. And that's how we led into explaining the response that, uh, that Toronto Hydro had to the storm. And that's providing a story to reporters who picked up the story. If you just provide the information, you're leaving reporters with the, the job of then interpreting that and creating their own story. So you've, you've got to uh, in an issue, uh, work with the reporters and provide a narrative if you want to be understood on your own terms. I love it. You know, one thing that I find, even okay, personally, when you hear marketers or you hear people talking about you need to tell a story, whether it's for your brand or for your marketing, for you know, telling the story of your brand, it's, uh, it's such an abstract concept. Yes, we know what a story is, but it's very hard to do what you just did to take what's happening or what has happened or what you've developed or what has, you know, whatever the situation is and actually look at it from a story perspective, a story, like, you know, develop that storyboard, that story, that timeline. So it's, it's, I think, and I think that that's a big challenge for organizations, especially in a crisis where there's no time to reflect. <laughs> so, well, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, just as a, as an aside, I mean, lots of people in our industry uh, get all kinds of awards for how they deal with a crisis. But what you really should get awards for is how you avoided a crisis. And, and it's, it's risk management, not crisis management, that's most important. So when you look at, you know, from the point of view of any organization, your job as a communicator is to... Uh, do a landscape assessment to say what really are the risks that are out there. What are the five to ten to fifteen things, depending on the type of organization? Uh, the what are the risks and the level of those risks uh, that could impact us? And let's prepare. You know, let's have a playbook as to how we manage risk. Let's ensure that we know how to escalate a risk throughout the organization, and make sure our senior executives know that. That we know, so that they don't react uh, ahead of uh, of us when something breaks, and they, they know that the organization is on it. And then, then prepare, test yourself, you know, sim do crisis simulations, and prepare your spokespeople. And then, when you see this risk starting to emerge, in many cases, you're able to cut it off right away because you've anticipated it. You know where it could lead, uh, and you know what the right response is. And very often, where a crisis uh, takes off and becomes a wildfire in an organization. It's because of the 
initial either the reluctance to speak or the initial stumbles uh, as the crisis gets started. And you know, here's what's interesting about that from a storytelling perspective is a lot of issues are ultimately values-based and based on human emotion and trust. Mm -hmm. And organizations typically will respond to what is an emotional narrative with a rational answer. And that's not what people want to hear. And it doesn't, it makes it sound like, A, you didn't hear me, uh, and B, uh, why should I trust you? Because you don't seem to have the character and values that I expect. And it's, if you look at a storytelling approach, you know that you have to win both emotionally and rationally on an issue. And the minute you start to think about the emotional part, you've got to empathize with your audience and understand how to reach them. And that's, that's one of the core attributes of storytelling is that empathy with the person you want to talk to. And it, it's so true. You can't, an organization, we see it happen all the time, too often, organizations attempt to trump emotion with logic. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't happen. No, not at all. Uh, it's very often a, a conflict of values, right? And when you look at the kind of statements that, uh, that really influence a crisis, and I, I, I often think of the, the CEO of BP when he said, I want my life back, uh, that's an emotional statement that he made. And uh, you don't know that, you know, was that the 17th interview he did that day or did he spend six hours with that reporter and then let his guard down and said something, you know, very human, very foolish. But, but the, that message is an emotional message and that became the message regardless of anything else the organization said. And so these are very often values. And if I go back to the example that I started with, you know, with Michael McCain at a key moment of that crisis, he said, I'm going to do the right thing regardless of the cost or legal liability. And, you know, that's a hard thing to get through your lawyers and it's a hard thing to get through perhaps your board of directors. But when you're courageous enough to say that, you're winning on the emotional side and, and you're winning on values. And, and, and ultimately, with that organization, despite the crisis, five months after the crisis, their good opinion scores of the brand were higher than before. It's amazing. And it's, it's amazing to see a, a key executive, a CEO of such a big organization, suffer at risking a lot, not risking a lot, but the crisis is risking a lot. It's it, like you said earlier, that could have been irreparable, the repercussions that could have resulted from that crisis. And to hear that, that's, and to see the results that came from that, the positive results underlines every message that, you know, us as crisis managers are always, always just trying to communicate is that connect on that human level on show the compassion, show the empathy. And when you connect on and you Allow yourself as the leader of the organization to become a little bit vulnerable because you are, so you don't try to hide that with strength or what can appear as ego. It People connect to you. People understand. People are want to forgive. They don't want to you know, hold a grudge or be upset with an organization that they, prior to that moment, might have loved, you know, felt deeply connected with. Yeah, it's it's interesting that the the public understands as most everybody does that you know bad things happen to good people or people make mistakes or errors happen and there's there's consequences and what matters is not so much what happened as how you respond to it because what the public are looking for is character and so it's a matter of how do you, how how did you handle this? You know, did you did you do the right thing when uh, a crisis hit you? Did you empathize and care about the people who were who were hurt by that crisis? And are you committed to being open and transparent with us in sh telling us how you're going to resolve that crisis and how you're going to ensure that this doesn't happen again? And if you lead on those four areas, you win. And it could be a really, really bad crisis, but it, it's, it, things do happen and the public understands that. What they don't understand and shouldn't understand is when something happens 
and you have been entrusted, you know, in some cases you're a regulated business or you're, you're a very powerful business. And so you, there's this kind of a public license to, to operate where people trust you to do the right thing and you show you that you don't deserve that trust. That's when you really get punished. Absolutely. So walk us through the, the steps or an outline, I should say, for that in order that somebody listening that um, to us right now can take away and say, okay, if we want to start really grasping what it means to tell our story in a crisis, even amidst all of the heat that we may be in and under in the moment, how can we put that as a you know as an outline now so that we can more fill in the blanks and make sure we're doing that correctly in the moment did that make sense yeah it's it's not as though there's um uh, a playbook that you can fill in uh that um says here's like five steps that you must take to be effective in storytelling in a crisis it's the it's it's a lot of it is approach. You know, there's there are steps of you know how you build a story, but in a crisis, you're you're not likely to have the the luxury of doing that. I mean, I gave the example of Toronto Hydro and having a narrative, and that's very very important. But I think the first step, and it's a it's a key step in storytelling overall, is empathy with the audience that matters to you, and it's it's about understanding that. Whatever you are going to say is going to be told within the truth of the audience that's listening. And so you need to understand how they perceive an issue, what values are at stake from a a human and emotional point of view, and what their expectations are. And so it starts with a deep understanding of, of how people interact with your brand. And, you know, that's a... That's kind of a fascinating area because I, I, I just did a thought leadership breakfast this morning uh, with Christian Madsberg, who um, is the co-founder of Red Consultancy in New York. Uh, a, I'd say a market research branding agency. It's, hard, it's actually hard to, uh, to put them in a little box, uh, but they use the human sciences to solve business problems. And in listening to his presentation this morning, it's very clear that almost uh, no one really understands uh, their target audience in terms of how they experience a brand. So a lot of uh, market research is based on analytics, but not real knowledge of the human condition. And so if that's true in the way that a a brand is experienced, uh, when you look at a crisis, you need to absolutely understand the audience that that is going to care about this. And then that's, that's another key point is uh, when you look at the response to a crisis and then you look at, uh, at social media, social media sometimes becomes a story and media will cover the amplification or escalation of a story on social media. But you've got to uh, look through um, the, the audience there and find the people who matter. And in most cases, you're discarding a lot of people who are just angry uh, and happen to be angry at you today uh, and will be angry at somebody else tomorrow. But within that huge group, there are 5 to 10 to 15, maybe 20 percent who actually are thoughtful. And if you're going to communicate, those are the people that you want to engage with. And so a lot of the storytelling approach is, is rested on who's the audience. Uh, and if you if you're not aware of that audience, you're not going to be effective in reaching them. Good information. And um, do you think that it helps? I think. Well, do you think that it helps to in or to have a spokesperson who is a natural storyteller as a human being, as a person? Yeah, I think I think that's that's always an attribute. I think your spokesperson has to be authentic. And they have to be someone who is uh, the right person to tell that story. So, and that that isn't always your CEO. Uh, if I go back to the guy uh, from BP, maybe he shouldn't have been your spokesperson. You know, maybe it should have been someone else if he wasn't going to be as effective as you as you'd want. You need someone who's authentic, expert, 
and is really, really strong uh, at a storytelling narrative. And you look at, you know, there's a, there's a, ex- so many examples of Steve Jobs um, and his ability to use storytelling when, you know, he's on stage with other tech leaders who were immersed in the rational bits and bytes of an argument. And he was able to bring it alive by humanizing it and creating a drama and, and bringing the audience along to his point of view ju- just based on the strength of a story. So the foundation of a of any storytelling process is that storyteller, but they, you know, they need to be a good storyteller, but they need to be authentic. And yes, I agree. Absolutely. And it, I love the angle. I mean, this is what we talk about when we talk spokespeople, um, you know, getting the right spokesperson for, to represent the organization, in whatever situation they're faced with. I think that storytelling adds a factor there adds, you know, um, adds value when you add that to the list of characteristics. Yes, and uh, well, you look at storytelling, and I did a, a TED talk in Vancouver uh, back in 2010, and you know it's always fun to do those because when you uh, you start and you do your summary, you think you know a lot about storytelling, and then as you start to write, you realize that uh, the more you know, the less the less you know you know, uh, if that made any sense. Um, and so I decided to use it as uh, an opportunity to explore why storytelling is is powerful and why storytelling is the difference between speaking and being heard. And the three key attributes that that I uh, focused on were um, irresistible, believable, and unforgettable. And when you look at why stories matter so much is because they're dramatic narratives, they draw people in. You know, the, It's a conflict that needs to be resolved, but it's also people are looking for a simple answer. So it's election day in, in Ontario today, and the the person who's going to win is going to be the person who has the best story and has the most simple uh, uh, explanation of that story, rich in human anecdotes. So we'll see what happens tonight. But but if you can do that, if you can can leverage and harvest anecdotes to support your your position, and you can put them in a dramatic narrative, you're going to draw people in in a way that information doesn't. If you build that story with a deep empathetic knowledge of the audience, you're going to be credible and believable in a way that information isn't. And if you relay it in the form of a story, you're going to be remembered because just about everything that's stored in your memory, in your brain, is stored in the form of of stories. So if I tell you a story about a personal experience or experience that I've had at work, you're likely to remember it. If I explain to you using charts and graphs about why I did something, you're not likely to remember it. So stories are irresistible, believable, and unforgettable. And that's, you know, you're looking at what you want to accomplish as a communicator. That kind of lights up all the boxes. You know, it's, it's so true. And it's, I was actually just at a, I presented at uh, the CPRS National Summit a few weeks ago, and I sat in on a storytelling session. And it was amazing. The guy, the I'm drawing a blank, I always do this, I'm drawing a blank of what his name was um, right now, but he started his session with, he didn't let, you know, normally everybody was presented by somebody before their session. And the lady comes up to present him, and she says, I have I asked him how to pronounce his name or his last name and he just said it's unpronounceable my name is Todd so now I remember his name is Todd yeah and so we all kind of laughed and kind of thought okay that's strange but all right so he gets up to the podium or to the podium he didn't actually use the podium which is always a plus and he starts talking about himself he starts talking about his how he grew up and where he traveled after college and how he developed a taste for wine in France and how he discovered that, you know, uh, wine everywhere else in the world is different from the wine in France and why and how the wine in the U.S. and Australia is ruining the, the image of the wine in France. And he just goes on and on and on. And then next thing we know, we're being quizzed without really realizing that we're being quizzed. He's just asking, where did I grow up? 
Where did I go to school? What, mm-hmm. what ruins wine? And everybody, myself included, knew every single answer to every question. And you still remember it today. And I still remember it today. And I still remember the experience of him, yeah. of, of, how I, of how I experienced his session. It's so interesting. You, you look at a great storyteller, and one of the videos that I play when I do a workshop is uh, Richard Branson, and it's an interview he did with Fox News. So it's Glenn Beck, and he's asking him, uh, okay, you're a record producer. How did you get into airlines? And Richard Branson says, well, I was uh, bumped off a flight in, uh, I forget where, but, uh, and I wanted to get to Puerto Rico. And so the flight's not going to go, and I have no place to go. And so I went uh, to the airport management, and I found somebody that I could charter a flight from. And I took a billboard, you know, like a piece of cardboard, and I put $39 on it. And I walked out into the lobby where everybody else was who'd been bumped off their flight to Puerto Rico and held it up and said, $39, and I'll fly you one way to Puerto Rico. And that was the birth of his airline. And you know, his joke was, I probably made $39 on that flight. Uh, but you, know, you could tell that story in many different ways about why you got into to, uh, aviation. But when you tell it as that, that story, it sticks. right? And then he's able, as he's telling the story, to talk about what's wrong with all the other carriers. Because remember, he's the, he's the story kicked off with him being kicked off uh, of his flight. And so often you get treated as though you're, you're a unit when you're on an aircraft and you want to be treated as a human being. And that just opened up the, uh, the ability for him to then talk about the benefits of Virgin Airlines. So, you know, it's, it's storytelling is, is, is very, very powerful. It really is. And it's, you know, I think that, well, I'm thinking of a whole bunch of different challenges and, you know, I'm drawing from my own personal experiences or my own personal feelings or as well as from what I've seen from clients and organizations in crisis. I think that one of the challenges is on a human level, on an individual level, some people, some people are really great at storytelling and other people feel as though, you know, they don't want to take up too much space. They don't want to draw too much. They don't like to talk about themselves. Like that's Richard Branson's story is an amazing story. It's an inspiring story. It's, you know, um, memorable. But a lot of people wouldn't think to tell it that way because I don't know if it's that they wouldn't think people care. They don't want to draw too much attention to themselves or feel like they're talking too much about themselves. They don't want, they don't feel comfortable. So I think that that might be, do you see that? with executives who need to grasp this and and the art of storytelling for crisis communications yes uh but it's it's a deeper thing than than crisis it's um sometimes it's 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 a cultural belief around leadership right and some some people believe that that leaders uh should be out front and should be uh, the, the focal point of the narrative about their business and other people think that they should be a little bit more modest and uh, and uh, be in the background and be uh, sort of a humble servant. I mean, there, there are different approaches and sometimes if you're saying you need to be a storyteller to somebody who really feels that they should have a more modest presence to be effective, it's, it's going to be tough. But Ultimately, you know what's interesting. You talk about business leaders. Roger Martin has a book out called "The Design of Business." So he's the dean of the Rotman School of Business at the U of T, and he's talking in one of the uh, chapters about operational structures, and he gives three examples, and then cautions uh, the reader that you know you can't describe the operational structure of uh, uh, of your business, unless you use anecdotes, and if you're going, in, you use anecdotes to tell stories, and if you do not relay it to people in the form of a story or a metaphor, no one will understand what you're talking about. And so, it's good business practice, period, to speak uh, in terms of stories and to keep it simple, because y- you people sometimes, you know, there's, if you look at the what and the why. Of uh, of what you're communicating, 
there are a lot of leaders that don't believe the why is as important as it truly is. People want to know the why. And within your own organization, most importantly, they want to know that you get the why right. And the why is told through emotional narratives. And emotional narratives are stories. And if you can't do that simply and effectively, you can't actually build consensus within an organization. And so to, to take it back to crisis, if you want to rally your, your organization inside in response to a crisis and clearly demonstrate your values, you've got to do it in the form of, of storyable narratives because they, they actually can't be told clearly in any other way. You can't point to... Uh, a poster on the wall that says, you know, here's our mission statement or here's what we believe. Uh, you got to bring it alive in, in stories about your behavior that show that you actually do that. You know, as you're saying, people want to know the why. All I can picture in my mind is a, a child asking their parent for something and the answer is no. But why? Because I said so. You know <laughs> that. And, and it's never, <laughs> we didn't like that as kids. <laughs> I know I didn't. So we don't like it as adults. We want, we want, it all comes back to humanizing. Yeah. And, you know, if I, if I think about it in terms of the industry that I'm in, but I think it's relevant to every industry now. Uh, if people don't like the why uh, and your only answer is because, you know, I told you, they get up and they leave. Uh, and it's so easy for anybody in any organization who's got talent doesn't matter what the economy is. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are uh, in the external environment. If you have ability, you'll find a job. And you'll lose your best people if you get the why wrong because then you've become a commodity. And when you become a commodity, anybody can pay a higher price for that commodity uh, and you, people will move. But if you get the why right, then you've become something different. You know, when we look at our organization, we, we really focus on culture because if the culture isn't right, people won't want to stay. And I, I think that's true for us and I, I think it's true for just about everybody else. Absolutely. You know, as you, as you talk in that, the story of the Toronto ice storm, how they told their story in that crisis is, I think that that's exceptional. I think that even just you telling me that story, I'll never forget their story. Mm -hmm. And I can absolutely see, I think that telling that story, because I still see storytelling, it's something that takes a long time. Like I said before, it's kind of abstract when you say, okay, you have to tell a story or you have to, you have to create a, a, a dramatic narrative to tell this story so that you get ahead of the story, uh, you know, the headlines and get, you can feed your story to reporters to tell your story again. I think that that is, it can be overwhelming for people who aren't natural storytellers or who can't take, maybe they're natural storytellers for their, for their own lives and, you know, at cocktail parties or over a barbecue with friends. But then you think of something serious like a crisis or in this case, the ice storm and the impact that it had and the, the effect that it had. And then you have to dig through that and think, okay, what was the story here? And how can we communicate that? It's an interesting story when you think about it already. So you don't have to say, how can we make it interesting? But it's that whole key of teaching yourself, teaching your team, teaching your executives, your spokespeople, your crisis team to find, identify the story. Yeah. And, you know, there's another side to that. And that is when you're in a, an issue, what often happens is all of that equity that you thought you had goes right out the window, right? So you're a big organization and you do a lot of things uh, in the community. Your corporate citizenship values are best of class and you employ a lot of people. You reinvest uh, across the country and then you have an issue and all people can talk about is the issue. And it's as though you've never really done anything else and they forget all the other things you do. And, and the reason why I would say that that happens is because you didn't actually ever effectively tell them. What you've done is you've shared information in the form of news releases and speeches and announcements and you've allowed your organization, let's say you've got multiple business units in it, all to talk about 
the transactional nature of your business, but you never stepped back and said, what are the two or three things that we should talk about all the time that are meaningful to us? Not things that we necessarily need to have a new product or an announcement or a press release around, but things we do every day. And so, you know, does, does it matter that uh, we're uh, good corporate citizens? And what does that mean for us? And you look at a lot of different organizations. It could be diversity. It could be the environment. Uh, and unless they have hard news, they don't talk about it. But they're doing things all the time. And so the goal is to have a storytelling agenda that your senior executives and your business uh, leads have all agreed to that is very simple and focused and told relentlessly and that you have your internal communications team play the role of journalist and go into the organization and discover where the, that storytelling agenda comes alive every day for your customers and for the people who are your your broader group of stakeholders and talk about it. And so if you followed a disciplined approach like that, when you had an issue, people would have a better sense of what you stood for because they heard you talk about it consistently always. I, I think of uh, A.G. Laffley at P&G and the, the position that he had uh, about the consumer as boss which he said internally and externally for 10 years as CEO and uh, was on the front cover of every business magazine. And I think at the end of 10 years thought, you know, we still could have said that a few more times. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of consistency, uh, and a lot of patience to actually create an understanding of who you are. And so you, you've got to have a sense of what your story is and then stay on it. Stay on it and invest on it for a long period of time. You know, I think an organization that's really doing that well and doing, doing it in an industry that's extremely difficult to do it in is Synovus Energy, which is one of the biggest oil and gas companies in Canada. They're um, a, part, or a subsidiary brand, I suppose, of uh, Incana, which is a, a, a huge oil and gas company in the States. And they're doing, they have, oil and gas has a stigma, obviously. And it's, a, it's one that, you know, I do a lot of uh, conferences and speaking engagements in front of these types of groups. And one of the things that I see regularly, especially in the States, is that they're, as executives of an oil and gas company, they're very proud of what they do. And how they do it, how well they do it, how, how um, environmentally consciously they do it. And yet, because of this stigma, they're so scared to say it, to tell people. And then you have Synovus Energy, who is making, well, leading the way, really, in really clean, clean, you know, extractions of, of oil from the earth and what they're doing is they're screaming their story and from in so many different ways in so many different medias i mean they have a a splash website that is more to the story.com where it talks about more to the story and what that means every campaign they put out there is that there's more to the story than you know or there's more to the story than you think you know or that you've been told Come and see what we're doing, how we're doing it consciously, and you know how we how we promise to continue to lead the way in clean energy, in clean oil. And this this is great for their for their marketing, for their branding. But if you look at this company, they're a new company. They branched off of in Canada, I think five, maybe seven years ago, maybe ten. Anyways, between low, um, no more than ten years ago, and. They have never hit a crisis, even in this age where a lot, you know, pipelines are hard to get. And there's always a crisis in some way around some oil company somewhere in North America. They've never had a hiccup, knock on wood, for them. But this, the fact that they're screaming their story from the roof and connecting with, they're doing exactly what you we're talking about earlier, where they're understanding, they're putting time and energy into understanding how Canadians see oil and how Canadians see them 
and also how Canadians understand energy and electricity. And from there, they're creating their story, they're sharing it, and as a crisis preparedness strategy, this is amazing. It's so powerful. Yeah, and you know, Melissa, you know, as you're relaying that story, I'm thinking back to the the comment that I made about knowing your audience. And there's there's telling your story effectively, but there's engaging with your audience as you tell it. And if you're going to avoid a crisis and you're going to anticipate uh, what people's concerns are and address them before it is a crisis, you've got to be talking to people, but more importantly, you've got to be listening. And to do the stories properly, you've got to listen to people before you do the stories. And in fact, if you can co-create some of those stories with them, so much the better for you. And in our industry in particular, there's always this uh, worry that I, that I have and I'm sure you have that you spend a lot of time working on a particular issue. You've got to get yourself out of your office and spend time with your clients and talk to them and understand what they need. Uh, and that principle is amplified even more when you're in such a sensitive industry and you have so many powerful interest groups that can really be a barrier to the things you're trying to do if they don't understand you, that it's cr incredibly important to, A, be telling stories that show your character, your values, and how you bring them to life, but also in the process of telling those stories to be talking to people, listening to people, and understanding what their expectations are uh, in terms of, of how you're going to, um, to, uh, to operate. You know, it's, it's, it's fundamental to both speak, but it's fundamental to listen. Absolutely. So as you've been talking, I'm always thinking of the listener who, you know, is listening to us and saying, wow, this is, this is really good, but now how can I go and, you know, I receive a lot of pushback from, you know, senior executives or senior management or whoever I need to go and convince that this is something we need to incorporate into our corporate culture. So I'm always thinking of how we can leave them with some takeaways to help them make their points and progress further. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think that most people know intuitively whether their communications works or doesn't work. And when you've been going down one path for a little while and you're not seeing the results in terms of your ability to persuade people, influence them, um, have them trust you, uh, it's time to start thinking about you know the path that you're on. And you look at a lot of organizations that send out a lot of press releases and do a lot of speeches, but don't really do it in the form of stories uh, and share the anecdotal and human information that you know that really uh, persuades and connects with people. Um, they should be asking themselves, you know, what do I really know about the way that my audience hears me and feels about me when I when I speak? And when you know that you're not making the progress that you expect to make with a rational argument, well, then it's time to start to think of how uh, you turn that into more of a human argument and share it in the form of stories. And what I have found is there's a there's no quick sell to storytelling if you're doing it properly. There's uh, a lot of track that needs to be laid. But once you've gone deep on the concept and the theory behind storytelling, and then you show uh, how uh, it can work both in other organizations and within uh, the client that you're working with, there's an aha moment where somebody gets it and they realize – First of all, that stories have been the thing that have influenced you your entire life from the time you were a child and stories were read to you to today when you open the business pages up and you know XYZ company is either doing well because they, they understand their story or they're doing poorly because they got away from their story. I mean, you see that all the time in the business pages. Uh, and then you realize how powerful that is uh, and you've got to, you, you see how 
if you told things in the form of stories internally and externally, shared your point of view that way, um, you actually will be irresistible, believable, and unforgettable. And isn't that what you want? Absolutely. And it starts, don't wait for a crisis. Don't do your, th- your homework and get your theory and, you know, think you understand the art of storytelling and that you could, you know, leverage it in a crisis. Start before, as crisis preparedness, as a marketing strategy, as all of the above. Start implementing storytelling as part of your corporate corporate culture. The leading organizations out there today are doing that. That's right. That's right. And and it empowers them in a way that uh, that's surprising because the conventional approach of of just rational argument and press releases and information. Uh, hasn't broken through at the senior levels. I mean, you look at at communicators that are valued within their organization. Uh, those people are the ones who uh, are starting to gravitate towards storytelling because they see that it's such a persuasive platform and it actually elevates their importance within the organization when they're able to, to sell it in properly. That's my experience. It changes completely the dynamic between an agency and its client, but more importantly, the client and their senior executives. It's, it is absolutely a game changer. Beautifully said. Greg, where can everybody find and follow you? Well, uh, you can find me uh, here at Weber Shamwick in, in Toronto. So I'm at gpower at webershamwick.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter as uh, Greg Pow, P O W. And I think those are the two best places to find me. If you go on to YouTube and you put in my name, you'll find – you'll either find Greg Power, who was the right-hand man of uh, the premier of Newfoundland back in the 1940s, or you'll find me. Uh, and uh, you can find my TED Talk there that goes deeper on storytelling. Excellent. And all of this will be below the show notes – or in the show notes, I should say, over on the blog as well as iTunes and Stitcher. Greg, it's always such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share this amazing story on storytelling. You're very welcome, Melissa. And and it's a great pleasure to speak with you and look forward to doing it again soon. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this week's episode of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast. Stay tuned next Sunday when I speak with Mike McKenna of Team Solutions and we talk about emergency management and evacuation protocols. We appreciate all of your support and if you could share this podcast and even go on iTunes or Stitcher and write us a review, give us your thoughts and your feedback as well as any questions and suggestions for topics on crisis communications that you want to hear about, we definitely want to hear from you. Also, if you have any questions for Greg Power from this week's podcast that I either didn't ask him or that you think of during or after listening to the podcast, be sure to send me those questions and I'll make sure to get them to Greg and to get you your answers in the form of a blog post on the Crisis Intelligence blog over at agnesday.com. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, and I look forward to talking even more crisis intelligence with you next Sunday.